record. Start recording so I don't forget because having half a course recorded is, is not great. Cool. So let me share my screen. Uh, share my screen. Let's get that showing just what we want to show. There we go. Cool. Can everyone see my MATLAB window? We're all looking good. Great, Debbie can see it. Remember, you can use the thumbs up um, reaction at the bottom to let me know. So just to recap this, the kind of last few things that we did uh, at the end of Friday session, then we started talking about scripts. So remember, we, we worked out how to do a lot of a lot of different commands in the MATLAB window. We could write things out. And then we realized that that would be a bit of a pain if we had to write everything out line by line every time we wanted to do something. So we created this plot patient one script. And this is basically all the same commands that you'd put in the command window, but saved into a what we call an M file. So a MATLAB file that's .m as its file extension. And then as long as we've got everything in here, we can always run it and it should just run. So if we do plot patient one, which is the name of the script, then that's going to run and it's printing a figure to a file. Remember, that's what we, we told it to do with this print command at the bottom. And it's just kind of going through that and, and sorting it all out. And you see that's worked fine, exactly the same that it did uh, on Friday. We don't have to change anything. We don't have to go back and enter any more commands because of these scripts. And then we talked about um, you know, one of the benefits of using a programming language, using a computer to do these things, is the fact that computers can do lots and lots of things very, very quickly and lots of repeated tasks again and again and again. So we talked about how we do that um, using these for loops. So this is a, a demo to, to sum all the even numbers between one and 10. So we take a total, our for loop says for some variable between two and 10 going up in increments of two. For each of these, we take the total, we add whatever that variable is to it, and then we, we save it back as total. So this is just incrementally adding all our even numbers, and then we can display the total. And we can run this if we type in loop demo, the sum of all even numbers between one and 10 is 30. So then we worked our way through some loops. We talked about the debugger, and then we left it on um, a couple of the tasks. So what we'll do is I'll just talk through these tasks um, and the solutions uh, to start off with. So let me put the link in the chat so everyone's got it. And this is the, the same documentation that we were working through the other day. Uh, we're down at the performing exponentiation task. So this task here. So if I create a new script, so I'm pressing the, the plus button, and this is going to be performing exponentiation. A task. So the task is that we want to compute compute b to the x where b equals four and x equals five. Uh, compute, not computer. Uh, and we can save this. And remember, we always want to save scripts uh, as whatever we've called them. They need to have the same name so that when we call them, uh, it knows what we're looking for. All this performing exponentiation. And we're going to save that. Uh, so we want b equals four, we want x equals five, and then we want to complete b to the x, so we can say the total is equal to, we could do b times b times b, all the number of times we need. We don't want to do that, we want to do this for, with a loop. So four, we want some uh, index, uh, let's call it idx, we want to go from one up to um, however many times we want, which is x. And for each time we want to say our total is equal to our total times by b. We can end that and then we can display uh, b to the x where b equals four and x equals five is, and then we can display total. Save, got rid of that little error. Everything's fine, you can click run. And that's going to give us a total. This is saying our total is zero. So why is that? So 
for RDX equals one to X, one to five, do total equals total times B, but we've set our total to start at zero. So we're always multiplying it by zero. So we've made a mistake there. What we actually want is our total to be one or our total to be B and then times it uh, X minus one times. So we could start with B and do one minus X, uh, X minus one, sorry. And then this should give us the right answer, 1024. So the next uh, task then is to increment with loops. We wanted to write a loop that spells the word uh, aluminium or aluminum, depending on your preferred spelling, adding one letter at a time. You just want to spell it as we go along. So how can we do that then? Again, let's call this um, spell aluminium. Um, remember we have to call our m file the same thing there we go. Ooh, I've, put, I've put a mistake in there so this is telling me we won't be able to run the file unless you change its name that's because i've accidentally put a space in there so you can't have spaces and file names from that then so remember, all these errors are not bad things. They're really helpful. If you read the read the, what they say, they normally contain um, good information. MATLAB errors tend to be much better than a lot of programming languages. Some languages, the errors are a nightmare and they're really difficult to understand. MATLAB has put a lot of time into to making sure they can you can understand um, what's going on. So our word then, we're going to say aluminium. We want to display each letter at a time. So for each letter equals one to, remember we have this length function that just finds the length of, of some word or some string. We can say end. And we want to use the display function because we want to print out something. We want to print out um, the first letter all the way to the uh, nth letter. So adding one each time. Uh, let's see if that works. If we click run. That's perfect. That's exactly what we wanted. Okay, so the last task, uh, which you may or may not have got up to, but we'll talk through again, was looping in reverse. So we can loop using this colon uh, operator to kind of iterate through each thing. So this goes one by one to, to the end. Uh, or we could have added, we could skip every other one by doing this and saying one by two to end. Um, but you could also do uh, one by minus one to, uh, to end. I mean, this wouldn't work because it would be the other way around. But if we swap these and did it backwards, so we start at the end, go minus one all the way down to the first, then you could see that this does it exactly the same backwards. So looping backwards is just the same as counting down from wherever you started down, incrementing down by minus one. So that's the only thing that, that needs to change. All the other code can say the same. It's just whichever bits we want to iterate around, we can switch the order to loop backwards. Any questions about any of that? Everyone happy? Uh, everyone managed to get those tasks done? Feel free to shout up if you had any problems with any of them. Seeing some good thumbs up. Cool, cracking. So moving on then. So we now we've got some basic idea of how these loops work and how we can use them to um, think about lots of things and do lots of things in a, in a kind of structured way. Well, we've, we, if we think back to what we were doing uh, back when we made this plot patient uh, script, we are trying to read one of our data files. Remember, we've got 12 of these information data files, and then we are trying to plot some information about that single data file. But realistically, we're not going to only be concerning ourselves with a single data file. We're going to be really interested in how do we do these operations to every single data file that we have? How do we plot, say, summary statistics for all our data? How do we do some analysis on all our data. You know, we're never just restricting ourselves to one 
um, one file and, and one set of uh, information. We want to be able to kind of do these things for everything. So if I just make my command window big, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to use the CLC. So this clears the command window, clear C for command window, just so we can have something nice and clean to work with. So the first thing we want to do uh, is we want to know how many files we've got. So remember, we can use the ls command to list everything um, in a folder. So we want to know what's in our data folder. So this star is just a wildcard. It says everything that matches um, this structure here. And you see we've got those 12 CSV files that contain all our data files. If we want to kind of extract all the information about those, what we can do is, is MATLAB has a dir command for directory. And again, if we want to see how to use it, you'll remember we talked a lot about the help command and that gives us a lot of information on how to use it. So dir uh, and then dir name lists all the files in a folder. Um, and then it gives some extra extra ways we can use it. So D equals dir name returns the results uh, in a structure with the name, the path, the date, how big the file is, whether it's a directory or whether it's just a file um, and some different types of dates. So all our files, we can use this dir, and we want to look in data and we want to look for things that match the name information dash something dot csv. So we don't want to pick up every file. There might be other files in this data directory, but we're only interested in the information files. And the information files have a naming structure that looks like this, and then they have a number in here. So that gives us a 12 by one struct. So that's 12 files that we found that match this string pattern here. And then the way a struct works is if we want to look at a particular one, we can say files of one, and that tells us what's in. Files of two, that would tell us about the second file and so on. And you see it's got all these, um, what we call fields, but all these different uh, entries here. We can access those using a dot. So we can say files of one dot name. And you see that's just giving us our name. Or we can do files of one dot folder. You see that's giving us the folder that it's in. And we could save this into a new variable, just like the way we'd, we've done it uh, previously. So we take the name and save it into a new variable called file name. And then you can see we've just extracted out the file name there. Um, we could do the same for, say, the modification date of the third file. So modification date, we want the third file. So we say files of three dot date. And then we can use the display function. And you see that this file was changed 22nd of May, 2018 at this time. Okay, so that, that allows us to kind of pick up what all the files are. So then we can do something with each of those files. And we have a way of working our way through one, two, three, all our files now using for loops. So let's minimize the command window. And we're gonna create a new script. And we're gonna call this script plot all. So this is developing code to automate information analysis. I'm going to call this plot, sorry, plot underscore all dot m. Okay, let me just make my editor big. There we go. Okay, so we can use this dir command. So we just in the same way, files equals dir. And then we need a string. So look in the data folder for files that are called information dash something dot CSV. And then we suppress our output. And then we can, oh, we've lost someone. Hopefully they'll rejoin uh, in a second. Um, we can say that the number of files is equal to the length of files. And then we can iterate over. So for index equals one to number of files. Uh, let's just display each of the file names. So let's say the file name is equal to files of index. So this is the first, the second, the third, all the way up to the last one. 
and we want the name. So we use that dot commands to get dot name. And then let's just display the file name to the command window. And remember, we have to end a for loop with end. So we can save. Let's make, let's make this small again, come back to our command window. So remember, we run a script by just typing its name into the command window. So plot underscore all. And there it's plotted each of the file names. And they're helpfully all in, in an order. Um, so dir, I think by default, will list things in alphabet an alphabetical order by file name. And that's exactly what we've, what we've seen here. So that, that allows us to find the name of the file that we want to look at. And what we can do there within this loop, we can load up that file and plot. But we're gonna, if we want to print this plot to a file, so if you remember before we said print, we wanted to print into results, into the results folder, or we wanted to call it information statistics. If we want to do this for each um, file separately, we're gonna want a name that makes sense for each file separately. We can't just use the file name because the file name ends in .csv and that's not an image file. We want to end it in, a, say, a .png if we want to print a PNG. Luckily, MATLAB has a couple of functions that we can do, uh, we can use for that. So one thing is the replace function. So if we do help replace, so replace, replace segments from string elements. So new string equals replace string pattern new, replaces all occurrences of some pattern in our string with the new uh, string or new pattern. So we could say our new string is equal to replace. So big shark as an example string, we want to look for the phrase big, the pattern big, and we want to replace it with, let's say terror. And then we can display our new string. And it's now Terra Shark. So it's looked in Big Shark, found the bit that says big, replace that with Terra. Let's just put it in like that. So that's kind of exactly what um, we want to do here. We want to take that .csv ending and we want to replace it with a .png ending. So if we've got our file name, we then can say our image name is going to be equal to replace. So what do we want to replace? Well, we want to replace the file name. We want to replace the bit that says CSV. We want to replace it with PNG. And then we can display file name and we can display the image name. Save. And then we come back to the command window and we type in plot all. You see now we have the file name information01.csv, and then we have an image name information01.png, and then the same for two, same for three. So for each individual CSV file, each individual set of data that we have, we now have a name that we can save our output file as. So we can now think about what we did in plot patient one and how we can replicate that in here. So the first thing to think about is if we want to plot each file, we want to be working within the loop. So the loop is doing this iterative thing again and again, and we want to do the same thing for each file. So therefore we're gonna to want to do this within the loop. So between the for and between the end. So, and also the other thing to notice is that we've not put any comments in here. So we need to put some comments in so that when we come back to this, we know what's actually going on. So let's say list all the data files in directory number of files so this this is kind of an example of a a comment that might be a little bit too excessive it's it's one line it's very clear what you're doing here you've used a very smart variable name that tells us exactly what it is but it often doesn't hurt to uh, add extra comments in especially when you're coming back to stuff after a long time so loop over each file and plot um, statistics, statistics. So get file name, get image name, and then let's delete these two because we don't want to print out all of this to the screen. What we want to do is actually do something um, 
more useful. So the first thing we're going to want to do is generate um, data path, and image path. So the name alone isn't good enough. We don't want just the name to load a file because we don't have um, that file in our directory. Remember, we talked about the path before. MATLAB has a certain set of places that it looks for when it's trying to run a function or trying to load a file. And that place is either the current directory that you're in. So if I press LS, it will look for all of these files or some places that are in the MATLAB path. So if we want to load something that's in data, we either have to add the data folder to the path or we're going to have to specify um, where, we're, where we're trying to, to look. So we can do this and we can replace the file name with this MATLAB command called full file. We want to combine the data folder with the file name. So the full file com uh, command just takes uh, however many sections you have and creates it into a file path that works on your system. So we could have done file name uh, equals data forward slash and then put file name in. Um, but some operating systems don't use the forward slash to separate paths, some use a backslash. So if you want it to work on as many things as possible, which ideally you do when writing code, you don't want to write code that's specific for your setup. You want something that you can share with other people and they can use. So the full file um, function is, is a useful one for that. Um, don't worry too much about exactly how it works, but you can use the help file and you can look at the documentation. Um, but for now, all it's doing is combining data with file name with a forward slash. And then image name, well, we want to put our images into our results folder, results, and then image name. So first step is load data. So we can say patient data equals read matrix file name. Um, and then we can create top figures. So just like we did before, we create a figure. We want to turn it off so we don't have to see it. So it doesn't have to waste time um, plotting a, a figure that we can see. We're going to use this subplot command. Uh, and we're going to say, let's make it subplot one, three, one. We're going to plot mean patient data along the first axis. So this gives us our average. Y label is inflammation. X label is day. Just like before, subplot one, three, two. We're going to plot the max. So I'm whizzing through this because this is all the stuff that we've seen before. But if you're uncertain about any of these commands, just shout and I will talk through them again. I'm going to X label. Remember, we always want to label our axes. And then let's plot the minimum. One, three, three. Plot minimum of patient data. Title min. Y label inflammation, label day, and then we want to print. And we've already got our print name. We've already saved that. Uh, we've already constructed that. So that's image name. And remember, we have to use this, what we call a flag that tells us what, what sort of image we want to produce. Uh, and then because we're creating uh, lots of figures, so for every run of this loop, we're going to create a new figure. We don't want to end up with MATLAB thinking about, say, a million figures. That's a lot of uh, memory to store. So we want to close that figure uh, after we've made it. And then we can hit save. We can type plot all in. And then it's got an error. So let's have a look at that error. Unrecognized functional variable full files. So that's what the problem is. And where is it? It's in our plot all function on line 19. So if we go to line 19, See, I've made a mistake here. We wanted the full file command and I've written full files. So we can correct that, save it, plot all. You see it's thinking. So if I just extend the window, you see it says busy in the bottom left. 
when MATLAB's thinking, you can tell that the same busy and this um, two carrots disappear. And that's done. And now we can go to our folder, go to our results folder. And you see, we've got all these PNG files that have been made with data about each of our, each of our data files. Uh, so we can have a look at each one of those. If we go to results, we right click, say the seventh, click open outside MATLAB. Uh, you can see then that we've got this nice file that's printed that's talking about what's going on in the data. Any questions about any of that? So for loops or how we printed or the scripts or anything else? Or is everyone okay and happy with that? Got some thumbs up. Cracking. Okay, so the next section then is making choices. So as we're kind of working through these programs, we want to be able to do different things for different data values. So we want um, the program to kind of assess what we're looking at, make some sort of choice and be able to, to react essentially uh, what, to what, what it's seeing. And we can do this in a number of ways. One of the ways um, that we can do is called an if statement. So a conditional statement. And um, that's kind of the main, main objectives for this section is to learn about conditional statements. So ifs, else ifs and elses, um, how we can test whether uh, things are equal, uh, how to combine uh, conditional tests. And then we've already looked at loops, but we can actually nest loops inside each other. So we have loops within loops within loops that can do lots of different things. So that's the aim for, for this section, the next kind of half an hour. Okay, so let's close some of these. So I'm just gonna close some of these uh, extra files. So we've got some space and let's create a new file. Uh, and we're gonna call this uh, making choices. We'll call it a demo script. And then remember again, whenever we make uh, M file, we have to call it the same thing that we want to save it as. Uh, and that's my Zoom playing up. There we go. Okay, so if we want the computer to kind of look at things and make decisions based on what it's seen, we need to something we need to use something called an if statement. So an if statement um, essentially works by saying if. Uh, something is true, do this, and then end. So the way this would work is a more concrete example. Let's say some number equals 37. We could say if our number is bigger than 100, we could display, display greater. And if we run this, so if we save this, and we run it, so we type in making choices, we see nothing happens. So what's happening is we get to this line, we set number equals to 37. We then say, is number greater than 100? Well, it's not, so it does nothing. If we wanted it to do something, if number was greater than 100, we could say, else display not greater. So now if we save this and run it again, it's now saying not greater. So it comes into here, it says, if number is greater than 100, do this, otherwise do this. And that's the basic form of, a, of an if statement. So this one is an if else statement, because we have one if, if that's not true, then we say else we want to do this. So the way it works is we start here, so line number two is run the four conditional. We'll put in some displays just to see where we are at each, each step. Um, if we do here, let's change number, let's make it 53. So this is gonna say 53 is greater than 100. 
let's get rid of this else statement and let's say display after conditional. So let's just see what happens now, see if we can understand what's going on uh, with this thing. So we're printing out before conditional and then we're printing out after conditional. So we've just completely skipped everything that's going on in here. So that's what this, this if statement is saying. It's saying, don't worry about what's going on here because this thing isn't true. What if we wanted to do um, several tests? So let's say we wanted to test if number is greater than zero, we could say that number is positive. Let's say we wanted to do something if number was equal to zero and we wanted to do something if number was less than zero. So we wanted to add some extra conditions in rather than just an if or an else. So we can use this else if command. So rather than just else, we can add another check in. So we can say else if number is equal to zero, we can display the number is zero. And then a final else. So this is just gonna capture everything else we're gonna display number is negative. So what have we done here? There's a couple of things to think about. One is the fact that uh, we've, we've added in multiple um, tests, as it were. And the way it works is it will always go through and check them each in order. So this will first check if number is greater than zero, then it will check if number is equal to zero, and then everything that isn't either greater than zero or less than zero will come into here and be run. So sometimes you can have uh, conditions that are um, would both be true. So maybe the first one is true and the second one is true. Well, in this case, only the first one would be run. So the, the order really matters um, for conditional statements. The next thing to look at is this symbol here where I've used a double equals. So what I want to do is I don't want to say number equals zero. I'm not trying to change the value of a variable. I want to know, is it equal to zero? So this equals equals is a conditional statement. So it's a test for equality. It says, is number equal to zero? It doesn't want to say, let number equal to zero. So now if we run this, and let's delete these extra displays, remember to save. right into the command window and this is going to say that number is positive and number is 53 so that's true so what other sorts of uh, tests can we do so we can do is something positive or negative we can do is something equal to something so it doesn't have to be zero it can be equal to anything we can also combine these things so let's uh, delete all this and make a new thing so we can combine conditional statements into one conditional statement. So we can say if one is greater than zero and, so we use the double and to check for um, two things being the same, and minus one is greater than zero, display both parts are true, and then else display at least one part is not true or rather one part is not true. We can save, we can run. This says one part is not true. So one is greater than zero, this thing is true and minus one is greater than zero. Well, that's not true. So the and um, statement is saying both this has to be true and this has to be true for this to work. If we wanted to say, well, what if this is true or this is true, we can use uh, the two pipes. So this means or. So this says, now we want to display um, at least one part is true. So this says either this is true or this is true, then do this. Otherwise, neither part must be true. Because if this one isn't true or this one isn't true, then both of them have to be false to come into here. We can save, we can run, and this says at least one part is true, and that's because one is, is greater than zero, even though this one is false.
Okay, so we've got uh, another task. So let me bring this onto the screen. So the conditions we've tested above evaluate to a logical value. So true or false. So one is greater than zero, zero is um, not greater than one kind of thing. However, these tests aren't the only values which are true or false. So lots of things can be checked for true or false in MATLAB. So one is considered to be true, zero is considered to be false. And you could put anything in uh, into these conditional statements and they might get some weird things if you don't quite understand what's going on. So here's a bunch of code. Uh, if you try and run it and then try and think about which things are meant to be true. So these are the things that we're testing and which things are considered false. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to work through that and then we can talk it through. So if you give me a thumbs up in the chat when you've done it or when you're happy, and we'll, we'll talk it through. Just give you one more minute to keep plugging through those. Remember to shout up if you've got any questions or any problems. Always happy to talk through things again. Okay, how are you getting on? Has everyone uh, worked their way through? Getting some thumbs up. Cool, let's just talk through what each of these do. So we can, let's make our command window big and use the CLC command to, to get rid of that. So if we want an empty string, display empty string is true and we don't get anything. So the empty string is considered to be false. So it doesn't have anything in it. You can think of that as just being, being false because it, it, it's nothing. Uh, if foo display non empty string is true. And MATLAB thinks a non empty string is true. So you can, you can use this to check whether you have something in a string or not. So whether you've, Used a, loaded up a file name using the way, using the dir command that we did earlier and seeing if it's empty, that'll tell us whether, whether we have a file name there or not. If empty array, display empty array is true. Okay, so it thinks the empty array is false. So that's consistent if the empty string is false and the empty array is false. What about an array that isn't empty? So what would we think? Do we think this should be true? Or do we think this should be false? It's 
So it is true. And again, that's consistent. So a non-empty string is true and non-empty array is true. What about an array of zeros? So we know that zero on its own is false. Well, an array of zeros is true, it's false as well. Um, what about is true true or is true false? So notice I haven't put a string. So this isn't a string that says true, it's some value that is true. Display true is true. I've made an error there, so it's telling me that I've not matched my delimiters, I've not matched my parentheses. Let's try again. Also, the word true is now no longer looking like a word for me because I've written it too many times. It says true is true. So that's good. And false is, is also false. So the next test, the next um, not test, the next task uh, is to write a script called Nia that performs a test on two variables, displays a one when the first variable is within 10% of the other and displays a zero otherwise. So I'm going to give you uh, a bit of time to work on this one. If you want to start working it through and um, put in the chat if you have any problems or if um, you're done, if you could say when you're done in the chat as well, that'd be great. Um, but I'll give you a good kind of five minutes. I'm just going to go grab some water. Okay, how's everyone getting on? Seeing a thumbs up. Anyone want a little bit more time?
Not seeing anyone else for more time. Okay, let's talk this through then. So that's uh, so we want to write a script. This is a new script. It's going to be called near so test two variables. We want to save this. The script needs to be called near, so we say near.m. So we want to take two variables, so let's say variable one, uh, let's say equals 1.1, let's say variable two, let's say that's 1.2. And we want to say, we want to display one if the first one is within 10% of the other and zero otherwise. So if var one over var two, so if it's within 10%, so greater than 0 0.9, and, and um, var one over var two, less than or equal to 1.1. So we've got two conditionals, so two tests. We've used greater than or equal to and less than or equal to, and we use the and and to test both of them. We want to display one, or else display zero, and we can end. So we can save, type in near, and that's going to display a one. If we make these bigger, so if we make var2 almost twice as big as var1, type in near, we're going to get a zero. Does that match what everyone else found or did anyone else do anything differently? <laughs> so there were a couple of things that you could have done differently while still hitting the briefs. So we've tested if var1 is within 10% of var2. But would the other way around be true? So if var1 is within 10% of var2, is var2 within 10% of var1? We could have done an extra test. But mathematically, it wouldn't have made a difference. So we could have added, added an extra test, an extra else if, and, but that would have given us the same. I mean, we. The test didn't say if it's <clears throat> exactly 10% what to do. So you could have just had a greater than here or a less than here um, and probably still been within the, within the, within the um, implementation. It's something to be aware of with programming that there's, when you, when you program something, it's explicit and it has exactly one way it will work, like with a conditional. But the, the question that you're given might not be uh, as well defined as that. So it's just something to be aware of that everyone understands what it is you're trying to do and what it is you're actually doing. So another thing that it's worth thinking about is the fact that we've got these two techniques now of, of doing stuff within the computer. So we've got for loops and we've got conditionals, uh, if statements, but we can combine these things. They're just you know, things that the computer knows what to do with. They can be combined in lots of different ways. So for example, let's um, create a new file. This is going to be um, some positive as it is, some positive numbers in a list. We call it some positive.m. So if we take some numbers, a list of numbers in an array, minus five, minus five, three, two, just one minus sign. Minus five, three, two, minus one, nine, and six. And let's say we want to add up each of the numbers that are positive. So let's say total equals zero for n equals numbers. So this is going to take um, our numbers. If n greater than or equal to zero, total equals total plus n, and end. And then we want to display sum of positive values and then display total. We can save this and we can run it. And there we've got 20. So three plus two is five, nine plus six is 15, so that's 20. So what you'll see here is it's worked exactly the way, same way that our for loop and our conditional, that we know it works. Um, we have two end statements, one for each, and we always align them up so that we're nice and easy to read. So you see our four and our end here are on the same line. 
then we've indented and then our if and our end are on the same line and then we've indented so we can easily see which loop or which conditional we're in at any one time and it just does works in exactly the same way the previous four loops is so it takes each entry in numbers checks it if it's true then it does this otherwise it just skips and goes to the next number what about the negative um, numbers what if we wanted to sum those well we could do the same and do a whole other loop or we could just do two checks so we could instead of saying total let's say um, positive total uh, and then we can rename, rename them all to positive total positive total and positive total and then let's say we want to sum the negative numbers as well negative total equals zero so if n is greater than or equal to zero, we're going to call that a positive number. And then we could use else, so all the other num numbers, the negative total, we can sum up with like this. This displays the sum of the positive values. We can also display the sum of negative values. Save. And then if we run this, I'm still typing in sum positive because it's the name of the script. <coughs> Positive values sum to 20, the negative values sum to minus six. So we don't have to re um, repeat all this uh, for code and the extra if and the extra n to do this again. We can just keep doing it within the for and have an extra check on our conditional to say, if it's not greater than or equal to zero, do something else. And those are negative numbers. Uh, we could even do the same um, with loops in front of uh, one inside the other. So these are nested loops. Uh, so this as nested loops.m. Yeah, that's a good point, Andre. So in Python, um, you don't have these end comments. So in Python, the, the way um, loops and conditionals and things work is they work based on how indented you are. And it knows that everything inside the indent is belonging to this statement here. So in MATLAB, you can write really bad code. You can write it like this, and it will work because of these end statements. But that's a lot harder to read. It's, it's a lot messier. In fact, if we highlight in MATLAB and use um, Windows key I, it will do an automatic indent for us. Um, it gives us nice looking code. So it's, it's always good practice to indent well, but it's not necessary um, like it is in Python. Python literally won't run. Um, if you don't do correct indenting, or it will run and will run not the thing that you think it's trying to run. So we have nested loops. So nested loops are one loop inside of the other. So let's say for number equals one to three. So this will run three times. For letter equals a b, we can display uh, num to string number. Remember that num to string. Uh, command that we used before and then we can display letter and remember we've got two for loops here so we need two end statements one to terminate each um, matlab's also done all the indenting automatically for me so that's good i don't really need to worry about that we can click save and we can run it nested loops and you see it's gone for number equals to one it's then said a and then b then it's gone back and it's iterated, sorry, it's iterated number equals two, and then it's done A, and then it's done B, and then it's done number equals three, and then it's done A, and then it's done B. So loops work from essentially from the inside out. So you start with your first value, and then it'll run everything inside it, and then the second value, and then everything inside it. So the next task then, uh, we're changing the order of nesting. So we've got a nested loop here, if we change the order of our nests, will that change the output or will we get exactly the same thing? Um, so write down the output that you might expect from changing the order of the loops, and then you can rewrite the code and test. So I'll just give you a couple of, a couple of minutes to have a go at that.
Thank you. I'll just give you one more minute to think about that problem. Cool. So let's see some thumbs up if you think it's going to change the output. Yeah, we've got some thumbs up. Yeah, so it depends what you mean by change the output. So it's going to output the same things because we're going to run over all the same uh, items. We're not changing what each of the loop are. Uh, but it's going to give us a different output in the sense that the order that it outputs is going to be different. So let's just try it out. We can just copy and paste this to save uh, having to rewrite it all. So we've got the same thing, we're just doing it in a different order. Click save and run it again. You see we've got 1A, but now we've got 2A, 3A, 1B, 2B, 3B. So it's taken the first one from the outer loop, done the whole of the inner loop, and then the second one from the outer loop and done the whole of the inner loop again. So it has very much changed the order uh, of what we're looking at. So we always work from the, from the outside in, we take the first and then the inner loop gets run to completion. And we could add in another nested loop. You can have as many nested loops as you like. Um, obviously that's gonna get slower and slower as you go. So currently this plot all, where's our plot all? Um, function gone. We've not got it open. So remember, we can use the edit command edit underscore plot all dot m. Here we go. So currently, uh, this reads in all our files, uh, loads the data, analyzes it, and then saves our plots. Um, if we wanted to kind of change this and display the plot interactively, what we'd have to do is change some things. So we'd have to change this figure visible uh, off. We'd have to change this print command and this close command if, it, if we just wanted to see the figures, because this would happen too quickly for us to see them. Um, so it's not a lot of code to change, but what we'd have to do is kind of comment this out, add in a new figure, uh, and then we'd have to comment this out and comment this out. There's not a lot of things to change, but it's still um, an amount, and we'd have to change this every single time uh, we'd want to do it. Um, but what we can do is actually change this. So instead of having to do this, we can set it up to do what we want when we want it. So let's uh, add some more comments. Now we've got some more functionality in here. Let's say we want to print the statistics for all patients. We can add some more comments. We could say save plots of statistics to disk. So that's another way we can do it. Or we can use a variable plot switch to control interactive plotting versus saving images to disk. So we're going to introduce a new variable and we're going to use this variable to, to say what we're going to do. And then let's add a comment for what the choices are. So plot, let's, we've done this a bit more, plot switch equals zero, show plots interactively. Plot switch equals one, save plots to disk. So this is now a really good comment. It tells us what the options are and tells us how to use it. So when we come back to this in the future, um, we will be able to easily understand. So plot switch can equal to zero or one. Everything's gonna be exactly the same except this figure thing. So if plot switch equals zero, then we want to have a new figure, else we want to create a figure that's visible off. Let's make this figure visible. And we can say on instead of off. And the other thing we want to change is whether we print or close it. 
So we only want to print it if plot switch is equal to one, switch equal equals one. Let's take out these comments that we've put in and hit end. And remember we want to indent so our code's nice and reasonable. So we just add that in there. We're not gonna do an else here because there's nothing we want to do if plot switch is equal to zero. So we can just save that. Um, we've got some error here. So where's this error? This saying the usage might be um, invalid syntax. That's because I've used one equals and I meant to use two equals. Thank you. Uh, there we go. We click save. And now let's try and plot all. See, it says it's busy down the bottom. And you see now I've got all these files, all these figure windows that are all opening. So that's worked. It's done what we want it to do. Uh, and then to get rid of them all, we can use close all, and that's just going to close them all. Okay, so that's the end of this section. So we've used uh, conditionals. We've talked about ifs. We've talked about else's and else ifs. Um, we've talked about how we can chain things, so it doesn't have to be one command. We can use the and command, or we can use the or command to chain things together. Um, and we've talked about how we can nest commands. So we've got a for loop and then a nested if statement here within the for loop, or we could do nested for loops where we do different things within the for loops as well. So for example, uh, if you wanted three plots, um, instead of a subplot, you could use this with a for loop if you did it in a smart way. So the way we've written this script is quite nice. It takes some input and does it, but we still have to change this every time, this plot switch every time. Uh, depending on what we want to do. Uh, it'd be nice if we could write a function that allows it takes us to put an input of plot switch and then does all this stuff that we want to do. So in the same way that we use some of the other functions like display, where you put in a variable input within here, so we could display the string input. It would be good if we could do plot all and then say plot switch as a variable in here. So the way MATLAB does that is, is through functions like this display function. And we can actually write our own functions that can do little tasks um, and tidy everything up quite nicely. And creating your own functions is, a, is as, as important as creating your own scripts and it's done in a very similar way. So in the next section, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna look, think about how can we teach MATLAB uh, to do new things? Otherwise, in other words, how can we write our own functions um, like some built-in MATLAB functions. So we're going to compare and contrast MATLAB function files, which is what we're going to learn, with MATLAB scripts, which is what we've already been doing. We're going to define a function that can take some arguments and do some things, uh, and then how to test it. And then we're going to talk a bit around why we should divide programs into small single purpose functions, as opposed to having these big long scripts that do million things uh, all together. So normally when we're analyzing data, we want to do things um, in a repeatable way. So for example, taking the mean of the patient data, we we're not having to go through and sum all the elements, divide through by the number of elements and calculate our mean. All of that task is taken up by our mean function here. So it's all hidden away. It's nice and neat. You see what's going on. So let's create a function. Let's close some of these. Use a little X to just close some of these. Um, and then we're going to create a function that just does a single task, and that's going to convert temperatures in Fahrenheit to temperatures in Kelvin. Um, so we click the plus. So we start in exactly the same way as we start with a script. So we can save it. Uh, and we're going to save it as we're going to call it something useful like Fahrenheit to Kelvin dot M. Just like a script, it finishes in the dot M. We click save. Now the difference uh, with a script is that we don't start just typing in commands. We have to start with the function keyword and we're gonna say some Kelvin temperature is equal to Fahrenheit to Kelvin, Kelvin. And we're gonna take some Fahrenheit temperature as an input and we end with an end just like with a for loop. So the key thing to notice here is that this is an output. So this variable here, some functions don't have outputs, so this isn't necessary. Some functions will just will just do something 
but let's put that back in for now because we want to output some temperature in Kelvin. The next key thing is to know that this is the name of the function. So when we call it, this is the name that we uh, use. This has to match the file name for the function to be valid. Sometimes MATLAB functions will work with the different file name to function name, um, but it will always throw an error and it can get quite confused. So you should always call them the same thing. And then whatever variables we have as input will come in here. So in this case, we're going to make a single input and that's going to be our temperature in Fahrenheit. Uh, and let's give it a comment in exactly the same way as before. So Fahrenheit to Kelvin, convert temperature, temperature in Fahrenheit to Kelvin. And the way we do that, K temp is going to be equal to, we take 32 degrees off the Fahrenheit temp. Uh, and we times it by five over nine. And then we add 273.15. So that's just the uh, formula to convert between Fahrenheit and Kelvin. And then because we've set K temp as our output variable, so it's going to save it within this file. And then when you run the function, it's going to save whatever your output is to that variable there. So we can click save. And then we can we can call it. So we can say uh, temp in Fahrenheit equals let's say uh, 112. And temperature in Kelvin. We can call it the same way we'd call any function Fahrenheit to Kelvin. And then we're going to use this temp in Fahrenheit. And there we go, it's outputted some temperature in Kelvin. So let's have another script. So we don't just have to limit ourselves to single inputs or single outputs. In MATLAB, you can do any number of inputs and any number of outputs, you just have to specify them. So you always have to start with the function code. We can then have our list of output variables in an array. That's going to be equal to whatever we've called our function name. Remember, our name has to be the same thing that we call our end file. And then we can take however many uh, inputs we need, give it a helpful comment so that when we use help on it, it gives us some useful information. Um, then we take the body. The body is just the the main part of the function that actually does the bit you're interested in. Out one equals something calculated. Out two equals something else. And then end. Remember, we always end with an end. This is just going to do some stuff. You see, we've got errors because this, this isn't actually going to work. It's just some example. But we have any number of outputs. We'd have to do something for out three as well. Otherwise, out three is going to do error. Let's say out three is out one plus out two. And then we take some inputs and that's all how it works. So the thing to remember, if we look at this example we've just done, so we've called it K temp in here, but when we ran it, we called it temperature in Kelvin. So if we type K temp into the command window, it's gonna say unrecognized functional variable K temp. So outside of the function, it doesn't know about anything you're doing inside of the function. It only knows what you're passing out and what you're passing in. So if you call it something different in here, that's going to be the thing that you know. That's the thing that gets saved into your workspace. So that's, that's one conversion. We could do another conversion. We could convert Kelvin to Celsius, so function C temp equals Kelvin to Celsius. That's going to take K temp as an input. We're going to finish our function with an end. And then we're going to add in our help commands. So Kelvin to Celsius, convert Kel Kelvin to Celsius. And then C temp is just K temp minus. 273.15. Uh, I've put a double equals there. It's helpfully told me that there's an error. 
So I put a minus sign in, I click save. And now because MATLAB knows it's a function because of this function keyword, it's automatically populated my name because it knows it has to be called the same thing as the function. Uh, so we just hit save. Uh, and then we can do the same Kelvin to Celsius. So if I can spell Celsius, 0, 0.0, so zero degrees Kelvin is minus 273.15 degrees Celsius. But what if we wanted to convert Fahrenheit to Celsius? So we could write out a new formula, um, or we could just take the two that we've already created and create a function that uses those two. So C temp equals Fahrenheit to Celsius, F temp. And we can save that. It's already populated the name, so that's good. Fahrenheit to Celsius. Convert Fahrenheit to Celsius. And now we can just use the two functions we've already made. So we can first convert um, Fahrenheit into Kelvin. I've missed my equal sign here, so I'll put that in. F temp. And then C temp is equal to Kelvin to Celsius. So on that value, the K temp. So two steps. We don't have to write any more complicated um, formula. We just have to do the things that we've already done. Save. And we can say Fahrenheit to Celsius. Let's say 32.0. And that's zero degrees C. Okay, so we've got another little task. So we want to do a function that does some concatenating. So concatenating basically means combining strings together um, into one string. So you can concatenate by putting these four strings, three strings into an array. So we have Abra, CAD, and Abra, and that concatenates in. Or we can use the string cat function and then do it that way. So those are two different ways you can do it. So the task is write a function called fence that takes two parameters, one called original, one called wrapper, and then adds wrapper before and after original. So uh, in this case, you can think of the wrapper as Abra. So Abra is going at the start and at the end, and CAD would be the original. And then you want to be able to run this um, function. So you want to display fence, with name as an original, star as a wrapper, and get an output that looks like this. So it could take a couple of minutes um, to work on that, uh, and then we can talk it through. Again, if you say that you're done in the chat, so I know what, when people are ready.
How are people getting on? Any problems? Have people finished or? People ready for me to talk through the solutions? Need more time? How are people getting on? Okay, I've got one thumbs up. How about the rest of you? Okay, well, let's talk through the solution. So we want to write a function called fence. Hang on, just sorting out my screens. So we want to call, write a function called fence. So we start with a function keyword. We want to have some output string. We want to call it a fence. We want to have two parameters, uh, original and wrapper. And we want to say out string um, adds wrapper before and after original. Uh, so we can do this in a couple of ways. Um, so we can either say out string using the array, we can say wrapper original wrapper. It helps if I can spell. So I'm going to double click this, replace it with original, and then I'm going to double click this and replace this with wrapper. Um, and then that's an arrow, see it's highlighted there. Uh, or we could use the out string equals string cat and do wrapper original wrapper. Either way would be fine. Let's just do the first one for now. Save that. Again, we have to call it fence.m. And then if we try and display it, so display fence name as our original and star as our wrapper. There we go. It ends like that. Okay, so we've got another couple of tasks. So um, the first, we want to write a function called outer 
that returns a string made up of just the first and last characters of its input. So it's going to take a single input and then return a single string. Uh, and then the next task is to consider the function that we used earlier. Then what does this code display when it's run and why? So it's 1056 now. So I'll give you uh, till five minutes past 11 um, to work your way through those two tasks. Uh, and any questions, um, just let me know. Um, if you finish them, then just have a little break uh, and then we can go from there. Two tasks that we had. So, uh, so we want to take a create a function outer that takes a string made of just the first and last characters of its input. So just to quickly show that, let's say out string equals outer uh, in string. Uh, let's give it the function, the help function. So out string um, outputs first and last characters from input. Uh, but it's called outer, not out string. So let's correct that. End it and then uh out string so we want the first and last characters so that's in string we do this a couple of ways we could just create an array that takes the first and we can use end to do the last um, or we could have done it maybe something like in string and then just take the first and the last like this that would be another way of doing it um, either way should work so if we save um outer um so and then we can display outer let's take the word helium and we just get mm. so that's that uh and then the next question is given this following code and what we had before what's it going to display when it runs so if we do fire to kelvin of eight so f temp equals zero K temp equals zero, then display Fahrenheit to Kelvin eight. Well, that's still that. It doesn't know what uh, K temp is. We can do display Fahrenheit to Kelvin, let's say 41. That's going to give us a slightly higher value. And then something in between Fahrenheit to Kelvin 32. That gives us something in between. But K temp itself, that's still zero. So even though K temp is used within this function, it only knows about it when it's within this function. So we've set it to zero outside the function, so it stays at zero outside the function. So the advantage of doing things like this and writing these little small function files is that we can reuse things, we can test that they work correctly. And we can we can use them in a, in a kind of sensible way rather than having to redo the same code all the time that nobody wants to do so let's think about analyzing this data set again and let's make a function that's going to center some data that we're going to put it around a particular value so we're going to call this function center it's going to have some output center it's going to take our data it's going to take some value that we want and it's going to change the average of our data um, to be about the desired variable. So we're going to take away the mean and take all our data. So this will work on any size data. And then we're going to add the desired value to shift the mean of our data. Save that and save it as center.m because our function is called center.m. So we could test this on our actual data but we don't know what the values ought to be. So it's hard to know whether it's actually right or not or doing the thing that we want it to do. So let's create a matrix of zeros. So we're going to say two rows and two columns of zeros. We can center Z about three. And you see that's it's got a mean of zero. And we've added three to each element. So it gives us three, three, three. And that looks right. So let's see what happens on our real data. Let's load some of our real data out. So we can use the read matrix function that we've used a lot. 
Let's take the first patient again, inflammation 01.csv. And centered, centered data is going to center our data, and we want to center it about a mean of zero. So centered data. Uh, if I spell it right, you see we've got an array. I mean, who knows whether this is correct or not, but it's certainly got some values in and those values have done something. So let's display some summary statistics and see what's happened to those. So min of data, this is our original data, uh, mean of data, and max of data, so just display those. And then we can do the same for our centered data. So min of centered data, mean of centered data, max of centered data. So you see we've shifted down by our mean. Our new mean is approximately zero. It's very, very close to zero. Uh, and the minimum has, has shifted down by the same amount that the, sorry, the maximum has shifted down by the same amount that the minimum has shifted down. So it seems to be doing a sensible thing. It seems to be doing what we want it to be. Um, but what else? What about any statistical properties? So has the standard deviation of our data changed? So we have the standard deviation of our original data set minus the standard deviation of our new data set. Um, well, I've spelt it wrong. So centered data is what I wanted to work on. You say that's exactly zero. So we've not changed the, the standard deviation. We've literally just shifted uh, our data to the, to the side, which is exactly what we wanted. And then of course, we forgot to add any sort of comments. And this is particularly useful for function files because we're going to want to use these functions again and again. So let's add these in center. Enter data around a desired value. And with functions, you normally want to give some sort of um, usage. So it'd be center data desired. And then what it's going to do. So it returns a new array containing the values in data centered around the value. Let's say centered around the desired you. So now if we do help center, we get all that information. It's all there. We can always do that. Okay. So a bit more uh, interactive stuff, but more programming. So we want to write a function called normalize that takes an array as an input and returns an array of the same shape with its value scaled to lie in the range zero to one. And then has a bit of information about how the function should um, map to a value. Uh, and then run this help function on this function called linspace um, and use linspace to test your normalized function. So think of a test that what normalize should do and use linspace to do that. Uh, and then we've got another, uh, another task, um, convert a script into a function. So write a function called plot data set which plots these, these three summary graphs that we've already been doing for, for a given file. So rather than doing it in the way we did it before, you want to take the file name as an input and then print out the, the, the graph in exactly the same way. So this is mostly using all the code that we've done before, um, but make sure that your function has, has your help text with it as well. So there's quite a lot to do here. Um, but get on and then chuck in the chat uh, when you get stuck or if there's any any questions.
Okay, so let's talk through this then. So want to write a function called normalize, takes an array as an input and returns an array of the same shape. So function um, out array equals normalize uh, in array Oh, uh, normalize, normalize, uh, scales array, array onto zero, one. Save that, and it's gonna pre-populate the name because we've already set up the function. So we want to do in or out array equals, so the first thing we want to do is scale the minimum to zero. So what we can do is in array minus the minimum value of in array. So that's just going to make sure that the minimum value is zero and then we can scale it so that the maximum value is one. So we can do out array divided by the maximum of out array. And that's just going to scale it like that. So uh, if we want to test this, we can use this lin space to generate regular, regularly, regularly spaced values. So our test um, array, let's say lin space between minus 10 and let's say four, and let's take a hundred. So the way lin space works, it goes from our lower limit to our upper limit, and we have a hundred um, points in there. So that will be our test array and our comparison array is just going to be something that's linearly spaced between zero and one with the same number of elements. So let's say out array equals normalize test array. And then we can say is equal comparison array. We can check if it's equal to out array. Some of them are ones, some of them are zeros. So maybe it's done something wrong, or maybe this is just kind of small errors. So we can actually work out what the difference is between the two. Comparison array minus test array. We've got some numbers in here that look like they could be quite big, but if you look that, uh, uh, I'm comparing the wrong thing here. So I can do comparison array minus um, out array. So you've got some numbers that aren't zero, but actually they're all times 10 to the minus 15. So they're very, very small. So that gives us a nice test. So the next task uh, is to write a function called plot data set that does kind of the things that we were doing in the plot all um, function. So again, we start with the function keyword data set this time we're not going to have an output so we don't have an output variable because we're not trying to change anything we're just trying to plot we want to take an input that's going to be our file name and we can take that input that's that variable plot switch and then what we can do is we can go to the view uh, tab in MATLAB and click tiles and click left and right and on the left we can put our plot all command and on the right we can put this new one so we can actually just see left and right what we're looking at. Um, so we can use the similar comments to the first thing. So plot data set and print statistics for single patient. Save plots of statistics to, let's just copy what we had before to disk. And then we can copy all these remaining comments because all of these are going to be exactly the same. Let's just make sure they're all tabbed the same so it's nice and neat. Um, and again, we want to use this variable to control interactive uh, plotting. So that's all good. So we don't need to list our files because we're taking a file name as an input. So we're going to want to get our image name. So we can just copy and paste um, this into here. Let's make it, we can use that to make sure that we're indented in the right way. Um, we want to generate our 
image path. So let's set our image name, give us a new line. So get image path, image path equals full file results image name. Uh, we want to do our file name. So let's just copy these two commands into here. And again, we can make sure they're nice and lined up. Uh, we can load our data. That's going to be exactly the same as before. Just copy and paste over. Uh, we can create our figures. That's going to depend on plot switch like before. So we can just copy and paste that over. And then all our plotting commands are going to be exactly the same. and our uh, plot switch behavior, so whether we want to print or view, so we can copy all of that as well. And then we, need to, we don't need to end this anymore because we're not within a for loop, but we do need to end our function and then save it. Again, save it as plot data set. And that's going to do exactly what we want. So if we go back to the single view. We can now do plot data set. Uh, Let's take in animation 01.csv and we're going to plot it uh, interactively. And that's just exactly the same plot, uh, nice and simple, just as before. Okay, so final task then um, is to take all those things that we've already done and modify the plot all script so that instead of doing all this stuff that we've just put in plot data set, it now just makes it into plot data set. Um, so we're now just using our function file that we've just made, this plot data set function, um, to save everything uh, one by one. So rather than having this big messy script, it's gonna be nice and simple. So give you another, give you till 22 to to do that and then we'll talk it through. We've got our plot all. So we set our plot switch, our files, our number of files. We still want to get our file name for each, but pretty much everything else all the way down, we can just get rid of. We can just call plot data, what did we call it? Plot data set, file name and plot switch. So we can copy that into here. Just paste it here and we've got file name, we've got plot switch and save and that's it. So you can see this is a lot cleaner. Um, it's much easier to read. We can see it all in one screen. All the separate data sets are in separate files. We've got separate functions to do each little task. So if we want to look at a function and we can open it, you know, this is doing something that's nice and readable. Um, it's much better to have things with each file having a single thing that it wants to do. Um, in MATLAB, like in Python, you know, single files can return multiple values. In some other programming languages, um, you can only return a single thing for a single function. So you really have to then drill down into, into very simple things for each function. It also makes it a lot easier to debug if each file is just trying to do one thing the whole code becomes more readable and, and easier to go through. 
so that's that's pretty much it so there's another section on defensive programming um, which just talks about how to to do some checks um, but that's mainly just just working through um, I don't think we'll, we'll do it we don't normally do it in this course um, we normally leave it there especially now we're down to just um, just one of you I think we'll we'll pause there um, so if you've got any other questions or anything you're not sure about happy to go through that again um, otherwise we will pause it there and uh, I can go and do some other stuff Thanks a lot. No worries. The recording should come out at some ah, point. Ah, yeah. Mm. I had a small question. So mm -hmm. uh, I think even in the kind of the carpentry kind of uh, in the guidelines, they mention uh, Octave, right? I guess it's a, an yeah. open source alternative. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is yeah. it is it actually different? I mean. Yeah, I understand like MATLAB, uh, it's my understanding, but uh, it's kind of a big thing. So many people use it. So there was a need for, for I guess, for some users who cannot uh, have access to the paid version yeah. to still use the code and stuff like this. So, but is there any, do you know, is there, is there any actual difference in terms of, I don't know, can you reuse without any major? So, so you can't reuse directly. Uh, in that there are some functions that MATLAB have that Octave doesn't, um, and some uh, syntaxes are very slightly different. But you you can open a MATLAB file in Octave, spend two minutes kind of going through, and then then it will work. So it's for most things it tends to be very similar. Um, the optimizations in Octave are not quite as good, and some of the external functions like um, so MATLAB does GPU. Um, acceleration and parallel computing acceleration mm -hmm. natively and i'm not sure how far octave has caught up because it's always working behind kind of what matlab's doing but for the most part yeah. octave is a good a good free alternative and, and is pretty much um just just like for like um i think it kind of really hammers on the importance of having good tests <laughs> Because there are some things that don't quite yeah. work in exactly the same way, but but generally they are the same. Do you have any kind of, from your experience, uh, do you have any uh, any issue? I don't know. I mean, maybe some particular cases or I don't know other considerations. Basically, why? So because I. Have much more experience. I mean, I have experience in Python. And I have I basically just started uh, doing some MATLAB because sometimes I don't know. You find a paper and say they use some MATLAB code, and I mean, obviously it's better to kind of to, to understand a little bit. But uh, any difference, like any kind of advantage uh, of either kind of I don't know, linked to some specific case. I don't know, it's like uh, maybe as you mentioned, uh, uh, some hardcore computing. I didn't have a chance to do anything like this in, in Python, but uh, I, I imagine like MATLAB has probably, uh, I mean, okay, the community is, is big in both, I guess, but uh, in terms of support and in terms of, I guess, some, yeah, as you mentioned, probably some sort of, uh, I don't know, maybe more hard, hardcore computing Right. Yeah, so MATLAB, could have MATLAB has some advantages. So, I mean, the documentation in MATLAB is phenomenal. Um, and the documentation in PyLab, in, um, in Python can be good, depending on who's written it. Some of it can be less good. But because MATLAB, I mean, as James has just put in the chat, um, which is just sent to me, actually, I think he meant to send it to, to everyone. Um, <laughs> I'll just copy it back in. Um, so the, the masterworks on resources are are really good. And because it's professionally done documentation, it's it's all high quality. Um, the big thing, the big advantage MATLAB has, and I mean the, the thing that makes them charge the big bucks is their um backslash command, so their linear system solves, which is just mm -hmm. unbelievably optimized. And they do a fantastic job. That and their ODE solvers have got a whole range of um, solutions for ODEs that do 
you know, all your variable step sizing, all your um, error calculations, everything. Um, so those kind of black box things that MATLAB do, MATLAB does really, really well. Um, and there's a there's a high degree of trust in them because they're a you know big commercial company. You're not just installing some yeah. some randoms package. Um, so those are the those are the big things that that really make a difference with MATLAB. Um, I mean, you know, anything you can do in MATLAB, you can do in Python. Um, it can just it can often yeah. be just a little bit yeah. easier and quicker in MATLAB. Uh, yeah, it depends. I mean, if you start from kind of just if you're just learning MATLAB, I guess it's uh, yeah, right. Oh, I don't know if Salim is around. Has any questions? I'm not sure. No, he's just oh, gone. No. Yeah. no. <laughs> cool. Well, we'll leave it there then. Um. Right. Thanks again for for your for your time. That was great. No worries. Good. Very, I'm glad very 